Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Teresa Brazen, and I am Senior Director of Professional Education. Um, I have with me today uh, a panel of um, so I'm really excited to share with you all these lovely ladies, really intelligent, experienced women who have been uh, in leadership positions for a long time and it's really interesting perspectives to share. Um, and I, I think I'll do quick introductions of everyone and then I want to do a little bit of framing for the conversation that we're going to have and then I think we'll do a lot of the talking and then I need to ask some questions. Um, so, first of all, I have here, this is Rima Duan, she's Corporate Director of Technical Services and Interiors at Taj Hotels. Um, she has 16 years of experience in hospitality, tech services, and design, Rental and Taj, so she's a very, she's got a beefy resume. Um, she has played a key role in crafting immersive guest experiences, and uh, developing and implementing strategic design roadmaps to strengthen positioning of Taj Hotel brand. <laughs> Impressive woman number two, <laughs> Sujitha Karnad. She's CEO of Sakai Sakai Solutions. Uh, she has been 32 years in high tech and IT, and recently decided to make a shift and become an entrepreneur. And so Sakai Solutions is a research-based, content-driven, tech-enabled platform specifically for women. And she has an engineering background and also, this very smart woman, has a doctorate in cognitive social structures. <laughs> it's Mary Warby. Um, she's the head of design transformation at BBPA. And she's coming all the way, well, she's living in Madrid right now, so she took a, a big break. Are you in Madrid right now? Yes. yes. So she flew in for this panel in an earlier talk. Um, she has 20 years of experience in banking, education, publishing, e-commerce, and games. She's led design, research, and strategy teams. She has an MFA in new media from the Academy of Art in San Francisco, an MA in international relations from Columbia University in New York, She's also lived in the United States, Europe, Russia, and India for a little series. <laughs> this is Deepa Bachu. Bachu? Bachu. She's CEO and founder of Pinsar, which is a design strategy and innovation consulting firm. She has 20 years of experience at large multinational tech startups. She's led design, innovation, and product management. She helps to, to pioneer design thinking and into it. She, um, oh, and in fact, a project that she led there uh, became part of a Harvard Business Review case study. There was a case study about it. Um, and it was one of their top 10 innovation must reads. <laughs> and next to her is Sue Cooper, my friend and sort of former boss. <laughs> um, she is co founder of Cooper along with her husband, Alan. Um, what Alan Cooper is known for pioneering design practices. Sue really, uh, I hope you're okay with me saying this, but built the company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they, uh, she did that for 25 years, so knows a lot about building companies. And in particular, and I can attest to this, she, she really focused on fostering a, a culture that supports, empowers, and develops creative leadership in the people that work in the organization. And prior, she was a marketing executive at Logitech and Digital Research. <laughs> Last but not least, Cornima Girish. She's the GM of Digital Development at Shell India. She has 20 years of global experience in R&D, in building technology organizations, and developing new products. She has a master's in software engineering from the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. And she, like all of these women, is a big champion for women in technology. So before we get started, um, I wanted to lay a little bit of foundation for the conversation. Um, 
And I want to start by asking you to imagine that you are going to have to give a talk at a conference like this one. You have to create it, figure out what it's going to be, rehearse for it. And you're going to do that with a partner. And that partner is someone who's different from you. They are of another gender, the opposite gender of you. Maybe they come from a place like Russia, so they also have a different cultural background. So what do you think the impact of just that knowledge would have on what you would create? Well, there is a lot of research, and there's a large body of research that is from organizational scientists, psychologists, social scientists, economists, that tell us that the impact just of knowing that you would work with someone who's different from you would trigger you to work harder, to prepare better, because you would anticipate that you don't come from the same point of view. You would anticipate that. It changes the way that we think. It changes the way that we work. The other thing that's really interesting is that uh, if this partner were to share an idea with you, you would actually think that that idea was more novel than someone of your same gender and cultural background if they shared the exact same idea. And what's interesting about that is that it would cause you to broaden your own thinking. It has that effect. It causes us essentially to be more creative when we work with people who are different from us. So, why is this important? This is really important to design and to technology because we are all in the business of solving problems together. Big, complex problems, and they're becoming more and more complex as the world gets more complex. And those problems benefit from diversity of thinking. So that's kind of the premise of this conversation where we're going to head, is that diversity of thinking is a good thing, not only for, you know, ethically as, as you know, culturally, but also because it gets us to do better work. It causes that within us. So that all sounds great. This is not a new conversation. There are a lot of, I've actually met a number of women since I've been here who have been on panels about women in leadership. This is a conversation that's been happening in the United States. Things are changing. They're not completely changed. In India, my first day here, I saw three different billboards about educated girls. When women, what is it, when girls read the India meetings, I think was the tagline, one of them. And there is uh, some recent research that says that child marriage is, has dropped significantly. And in fact, in Southeast Asia as a whole over the last 10 years, it went from 50% to 30% in large part because of the progress in India. So change is happening. On the other hand, it's not totally changed here, and it's also not totally changed in the United States. We'll get there in a second. India is, unfortunately, the third lowest ranked in the world for women in senior leadership roles in the world, and it's been that way for the last three years. And of the organizations that were surveyed, this is from the Economic Times, 41% of them have no women in leadership positions. So we go back to diversity is good for innovation, diversity is good for our collective work. That's not a great statistic. In the United States, there, women, interestingly, have more education than men. They have more, degree, they have more higher degrees across the board. But when you look at what's happening in leadership, if you look at all the companies that are in the S&P 1500, 18% of board seats are women. 25% of executive management level roles are women, 25%. So women are more educated, but they're not actually in leadership. <laughs> Women are only 9.5% of top earners, more educated, but making way less money, 6% of CEOs. Okay, I don't want to be depressing. <laughs> what I do want to talk about for the rest of this time is what do we do with that? That is our reality. In both, in all the company, or countries that are represented, things are changing, they're not totally changed. We want to keep the momentum going, what do we do with that? So that's the frame. So, my first question, for whoever would like to feel compelled to answer, and I'll sit down now, um, is I, I would love to talk a little bit about what are the current obstacles? What are the things that you all are seeing that are hindering women from moving into leadership positions? Okay. Um. So some of the things that I 
a question that I often ask, and I've been asking across several years is, what's the greatest limitation that you face or we face? And I think what we don't do very well is to tap into that inner reservoir, a repertoire of experiential knowledge. You know, we all have struggles and we all have experiential perspectives on how to solve them. And I don't think we sort of tap into it very well when we want to solve a problem. And if I can say that, and so in, in, in not in actually going to talk more depressive statistics, India is all of those that you did say, we have more educated women. We have women enrolling far higher in doctoral and in master's programs in India. But the sad thing is in the labor force, the percentage of women has been dropping steadily. It was 37% in 2005, and now it is about 37%. So we do have those depressing statistics to, as evidence to tell you that there is a decline even in the urban workforce for several reasons, and one of them being that the Indian middle class has got so much more effluent that they don't really want their women folk to go to work because they don't think it is a financial necessity anymore. And they sort of tell women that you would stay at home and look after the family. And the second thing is that the women, the cities in India tend to get a little unsafe. And therefore, you know, they, they, these are the, some of the top two reasons that we cite to ask women to stay home. So the labor force story remains here as much as a major problem. And you were right in the leadership positions even worse because as they as they progress to the uh, progress to the corporate hierarchy women tend to drop off the ladder because of these very reasons of family pressures and what them. so there are struggles everywhere and this is what i meant to say when i ask a woman what is exactly your limitation she has a lot of experiential knowledge on how to deal with it but she essentially doesn't know how to do it in India. And that is what I try to do in my work today by creating a platform which helps women find solutions to these struggles. And these struggles, I think, are global. So I'll stop here and continue. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
one of the barrier which I feel is uh, I I feel it's one of the prime barrier is in corporate level we often be evaluated based on our gender. So and there are certain criteria or maybe values associated to these genders. And if women uh, you know try to break these barriers, they be considered as maybe you know um, unfeminist or maybe you know not doing the right thing and confusing the entire thing whether they are on the right path or you know do they have to revisit their thinking and even if you pursue yourself very strongly there are corporate barriers such as uh, you know corporate uh, gatekeepers like this is how you should be dealing this is this should be the leadership style whereas uh, for men, there is no specific, you know, leadership style. But you know, for women, to conform to that, they might have to step into those, uh, you know, masculine uh, leadership style, bend themselves, and sacrifice their own identity. I think it's on a couple of levels. Uh, there are systems, like the rules, and the, the norms and behaviors that we all have in place that we've all grown up with, we're used to them, men and women. And then there's there's the cultural piece and the messaging that, that women get. And uh, I have an example from my, my past, before, before I became a designer, I was in the military, I was in the US Army. And uh, at that time, women hadn't been in, in the military all that long, at least in the US military. So the rule had been changed, but the attitudes, of not only the men, but also the women who got into the military were, were very mixed around should women be there, what was their role. Um, we found that women were judged by, by a different standard. Uh, the, sta the physical standard was actually lower for women, which caused resentment among the men. Um, but the women that were in, they actually had to work twice as hard. They had to exceed the male standards just to be taken seriously and to, and to prove that, that we, we belong there. Uh, so I think it's it's kind of step by step. You have to change, make a change at the system level, but then there has to be a corresponding change at the cultural and attitudinal level. And it's it's gonna be a little kind of a jockeying over time, I believe. Something I've observed over the years is when there is a success. Women are very hesitant to say, I did that, and to take credit for that success. We and I say, we did that. We did that together. My team did that. Oh, I don't give credit, you know, sharing the credit. So I think a solution, at least in our culture, is to have more people recognize when a, a woman gives a significant achievement or does something new or different for the corporation. And Echo, when you when we're in meetings, I, I try to do this, but when uh, someone, anyone, comes up with a good idea, echo that and say, what I heard Teresa just say, and say it again, but give credit to that person. Because so many, and I just see it over and over again, so many of us are hesitant to take full credit for the things that we've done. Whereas men's inclination is to say, I did this, I, I, I. <laughs> and it is so, I have a husband, and this is part of it, very good at that. And, um, and so I'm <laughs> quite practiced in raising my hand quietly and saying, uh, remember me? <laughs> um, so anyway, I think a solution is to echo each other. Um, so, uh, you know, interesting perspectives from having lived in the U.S. as well as India and sort of looking at the, I guess, the contrasts and the differences. Um, I want to start with a personal story, though. Um, I was in the U.S. and there was this project that was really, really sought after. And my manager actually nominated me for that project. It was extremely strategic, a lot of visibility and all of that fun stuff. And I was extremely tentative, but my manager was uh, really pushing that I throw my hand in the ring. So he saw that I was being tentative and he asked me, um, he says, you know, what's going on? Like, do you not, are you not interested in the project? 
And so I said, well, it's actually personal. And he said, you know, he, helped, he encouraged me to talk about well, what was going on. And I said, my husband and I were planning a family. And so he says, okay, the last time I checked, it takes at least nine months to <laughs> deliver a baby. <laughs> and so you're still going to be here for that time, right? And I said, yeah, but this is a really important project for the company. And it requires someone to be here at least a year. And if I get pregnant in nine months and then I'm out, what happens to the project? He says, do you think all of your male counterparts that have thrown their hat in the ring are asking themselves the same question? He shook me up and I got that job and it was the best thing for my career. And I tell you that it's, and I now pass that learning on. I say, make the guilt worth it. You know, make it worth it. Put your hat in the ring, throw your hat in the ring. I was, another quick story, my husband and I were arguing one morning, uh, this was in the US, where we didn't have all of the support, amazing support system we have in India. Um, so my daughter was sick, she was about two years old, and my husband and I were arguing about who stays back home to watch her, because we couldn't send her to daycare. And my daughter, she hears my husband and I arguing, and she changes her clothes, she's probably two and a half then, and she says, you know what, mommy, I feel better for her. Right? But she felt terrible that we were doing that. And I tell you, guilt, gosh, I mean, both my husband and I were terribly embarrassed for having doing for having done that. A lot of women say, I'm gonna quit my job, it's not worth it. What I tell them is make your job worth that guilt. Right? It's important to do that. It's important to keep your hat, throw your hat in the ring, get those challenging positions, and make that guilt worth it. Because I will tell you, my second child, when I took time off, my husband and my daughter begged me to go back. Because I was not getting intellectual stimulation at all at home, right? And I was driving them up the walk. So, you know, this is my, um, you know, advice based on my experiences that, you know, you're going to feel guilty as a mom, as a wife, as a, you know, whatever role you play, but you've got to make your job work at you. Well, and, and I'll add to that um, an experience that my husband and I had. We have two children, and um, he had to fight really hard for paternity leave, and he had to ask for it multiple times, and was discouraged from taking it, which is, I think, illegal actually in the United States. But um, and an observation that I've had is that uh, the systems of our company decide for our own families who's going to take care of children. They do, because men are discouraged from taking time to participate in taking care of their children. And a lot of men feel very, they feel a lot of pressure that if they take even a week or two weeks, most men I, that I know in the United States have no idea how it is in India, but maybe take one meeting, maybe, yes. Yeah. And it's, it's tricky because even if the father wants to participate, it, there's a double obstacle for him inside of the company, which is a shame. So that leads me to, I would like to ask a different question. Um, so these are some of the contexts that we're dealing with, that we're all dealing with. Um, and the one thing I know about leadership is that uh, ruthless prioritization is extremely helpful. It helps you to be a better leader. You have to decide what we focus on, right? So I want to throw that question to you. Given the complexity of our cultures, our work environments, you know, the history of you know that we all share, if our goal is to clear the path for more women to join the forces in design and technology and even move into leadership positions, if you're going to have to pick one thing to focus on, which you get the most bang for your buck, what, or it doesn't have to be the thing, it's a lot of pressure, but one thing that you think would be really helpful, what would you focus on? Where do you think we get the most impact? I think asking critical questions or building a mindset to ask critical questions. Because I think most struggles are a few layers below the surface. And, uh, and one thing that we did to get very hard on is 
has uh, we sort of get to hear these cultural discourses very often and we limit ourselves to the sort of members are going for. So aesthetic priorities are probably influenced very strongly by the cultural discourses we hear on a day to day basis. So if we could question and challenge some of this discourse, which could be that we have it addressed systematically from the cultural and the social fabric that we are embedded in, probably we have some that kind of step. So building this cultural first critical mindset or to question that I think is the So I think, um, you know, it's really important for me as a priority, and I would say for all women leaders, to sponsor other women. I think that's really, really important. I was sharing with Teresa yesterday that um, I was in the U.S., and uh, while I was working at Intuit, at this, this really sought after leadership training. And uh, we were at it, of course, very few women, um, but there were women. And um, the, there were uh, photographers trying to capture that training. And I was Indian, pregnant, and a woman, right? Mm -hmm. And so they really wanted a picture of me. And I have to tell you, I was cringing. I was like, oh my gosh, don't do that. Why? Because I think throughout my life, <coughs> I tried to blend in. In the US, I wouldn't wear Indian clothes because I wanted to blend in more. That is just so the opposite of what I now know and I'm like, older and wiser, I think it's important to bring your individual, unique self to life every <coughs> single day. And for those of us that are trying to blend in, it's important for women like us that have overcome that to sponsor other women. And I don't mean just mentor, I mean sponsor. And by that, mentoring is helping, sponsoring is putting your own reputation on the line, for another woman. And I think it's really important that both men and women do that. Um, you know, they say that tomorrow is International Women's Day. Um, we get one day in the year, the men have one day in the year. <laughs> so I think it's important that each of us, perhaps in this room, think about one promising woman, and not just any woman, and not because she's a woman, but because she's a deserving person. Um, you know, like you said, no lowering the bar because it's, it's a woman, find a good woman and sponsor. That's a really cool idea. And, and I want to, since it's one thing, Teresa, it's our decision. Uh, I'm normally a systems thinker, but, but I'm going to go super micro on this. And I'm going to go back to the mentoring idea. And I run a team that, that includes men and women. Um, and I try to mentor them all. And I think it's, I think it's particularly important for women to mentor men. Uh, it sounds counterintuitive. Oh, well, the men have all the mentors. They got all. I think systemically, that's there's a lot there. But change at the, the heart and mind level has to happen. It's, it's going to take the men, too. And if all the women just say, well, we're only going we're gonna to focus on the women because the men are focused on the men, that's just going to add more division. And it's going to take us longer to solve this problem. So, as counterintuitive as it may sound, I, I would I would suggest and recommend that women they they mentor the men too. I just want to thank my business partner for stopping the noise back there because I completely <laughs> forgot what the question was. I was watching all the things slide by, so thank you very much for stopping the noise. Appreciate that. That's what we need more of in, in our. Uh, in our organizations, when we see something that's wrong, we need to speak up. And I want everyone, I hope men and women, will speak up when you see something going on, particularly if a woman is being stepped on or pushed down or not getting equal treatment or fair treatment, please speak up. So thank you for speaking up to the noise. <laughs> That was mine too, because I think one of the important things for me is like to really stand up for yourself and for others. Speak up, speak out, raise your voice, make your voice understand and heard, and collaborate. And I think that's important, whether with women or men, just make them understand. Sometimes we feel that they understand, or maybe organization at a higher level, they understand your issues, but 
you know, it's always better to make yourself understand. I have one more thing. Um, I think that we should speak up in terms of not just that person, but why it's good for the company. I think if we put everything in context of why this is good for the company, then you get more response. If you say, I don't like it, then it doesn't get a good response. But if you say, look, this is an important initiative for the company and we're going to make 25% more revenue if we get this done by Q4, then you're hurt. So put it in terms that the executives of the company can uh, grasp onto and appreciate. I mean, I bring in some aspects um, of uh, culture here. There was this lady in our team who was very silent. Communication uh, is one typical thing that actually ma makes people open up and understand people. There are some people who just don't open up, who are in their own shell. Uh, how do you handle such people? Women has this knack of understanding and reading out things even, with, even without being communicated. The lady in my team was an excellent programmer, and but the problem that she faced was she was not opening up or volunteering to speak it out. Um, so giving a little push to such people and giving that confidence in them actually makes them much, much more, uh, they bloom out to be a, such wonderful, powerful characters in the organization that you would love to sit back and see them blooming. I mean, it's wonderful to see such people. I've been fortunate enough to have such people in my team in the past and I really enjoy when I see them uh, either in newspapers or uh, taking part in big major events or getting several patents in their name. These things really make you feel proud. So these are some of those things that women can, I wouldn't say it's only women, however we have a certain knack where we can figure out who's that. What is that they're bringing onto the table? And identifying them and helping them, giving a little push to them so that they bloom out. So building on that, one thing that I um, try to do is when I see a woman ask for something like a raise, as an example, I try, I begin by acknowledging that they just did something really brave and saying, I am really proud of you for you know, standing up for yourself as a woman and coming to me and saying that you think you deserve more money. And then we have a conversation about you know, whatever the request is, but like first and foremost, I really I try to acknowledge when I see women doing things like that. Um, and I also have benefited from being pushed. Um, my previous boss, Kendra, who Sue knows, um, basically threw me in a room in front of people to start teaching. And I, I do a lot of teaching today, and I'm very comfortable with it. But for like six months, I was wildly uncomfortable. Wildly, wildly uncomfortable. I was afraid every day at my job. And then there was this point where I got used to it, and then I started excelling at it. But I, I do feel very grateful to her for deciding for me that I was going to do something that I was uncomfortable with. And I think it's a good thing for us to keep in mind, given that it is true, there is research that says that women don't ask as much as men, um, that, and particularly those of us who are in management positions, that we're watching for that, and we're, we're prodding and encouraging and paying attention to, you know, is it, is it mostly the men who are asking for things and the women on my team are being really silent, you know? And just being observant of that, being aware that that dynamic does happen. Because if all you need is one experience like what I had, where you're pushed to do something you're afraid of, and it can really change what you ask for in the future. How much time do we have left? I just want to build on what Teresa said and kind of extend it to yourself. So sometimes you do have somebody that will push you in, and 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 you're uncomfortable. It's harder to opt into discomfort yourself. You were thrown in, and I've had that that fortune as well. But but I think it kind of gets to owning or, or, or embracing the guilt. 
embrace the discomfort because you're going against the grain and it's going to be uncomfortable. Own it, accept it, and, and put yourself in that uncomfortable position because it will get easier. It's hard the first time. I used to be terrified of public speaking to the point where I was shaking so badly I couldn't drink water when I was talking because everybody would see my hand shaking. So if I kept my hands in my pockets, I could get through it, and now I'm okay. <laughs> Do you all have any questions? I, I have a comment to make what you said about, about uh, being afraid in the first six months. Men are afraid. Men are terrified in those six months also. Don't be fooled. <laughs> Thank you. From the, from the time they're this big, they're told, don't be afraid, go out there. And women are told a different story, but they're just as afraid. I do have a question, um, especially for the mic. I do have a question, especially for the Indian. Yeah. I said, yeah. 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 I see in my company, basically, I see the girls are really scared of coming out. And they, when I talk to them, they feel like they are being judged. So I feel like it's a mindset. And how you clear those mindsets? Can you give them a push, give them everything? Still, the mindset is hard to change. And what do you think about that? And how to change their mindset? They know they can go to talk to their managers, or they can wear whatever they want to wear. But how can they be comfortable? <laughs> exactly what I said, that you really think. I said, this is exactly what I raised, like said, that you being evaluated based on your gender. I think we have to just drop the tax of male and female and, you know, perceive ourselves as, as a professional. If your male counterpart can go and ask for a raise or maybe reach out to the manager for some issues or whatever the things which are dealing with. So are you. So I don't think so that you should really restrain yourself for not doing that or judge yourself. And another thing which I see is that, you know, often we've been, uh, you know, uh, we just compare ourselves with, you know, other people like, you know, if they are doing this, then probably, you know, we should be doing this. I think every individual is different and you should have your own roadmap, understanding your own capabilities, your own inner self and just, you know, rely on emotional intelligence. Well, I had an experience, so we all have a workshop going on in our company where they're doing empowerment for the especially the girls who are not coming up. So uh, I, I take a part and I was trying to push and there was one girl, we, uh, we were having a task where she need to only pretend that she is talking with her manager and I was a manager. So I was not actual manager but just the, like a task you are talking. She was shivering, like shivering and bubbling and I'm like, what, what, why they are so scared of even talk to the manager and he's a man. Yeah, because I mean, from the childhood, we've been, uh, you know, it's part of our culture, we've been really suppressed. And uh, for many Western countries, it's breaking the glass ceiling. I think for India, it's first breaking the marble ceiling, which is like, you know, a fight with your own inner self. And then fighting with your families, like, okay, the decision which you're taking, you really have to stand by it. And, you know, first you judge yourself and then you just convince your family. Then you go out in a corporate culture and you know they're like breaking the glass ceiling and you know breaking all these barriers so that's why i think it's important for women to understand each other empower each other and rather than pulling each other as down because i have seen in corporate uh, a thing that you know they really pull each other down because this is this is how they refer their success yo shit i also wanted to be in this situation or i wanted to achieve that so and why to hold yourself back? What will what will happen? <laughs> Nothing. You should always raise your voice and speak out for yourself. Nothing wrong. Yeah, I have a slightly different perspective. Um, 
I think, um, you know, for me, what's worked is to say less about men do this, women do this, mm -hmm. and talk about my own stories. Um, you know, the story that I mentioned about my daughter, uh, the last time I said it, I, I really cheered up because it was a very emotional story for me. As I was telling the story, there was a woman in the audience that had a question, but she couldn't say it because she was so emotional, right? And I actually let her, she was cheering up, and I said, it's okay, it happens to me as well. And I pointed to what just happened to me as I told the story, right? So I think somewhere to make it okay and lead by your own stories versus, you know, say, people tend to be like this or like that because you don't really know what their cultural context might be. Um, I think being vulnerable as a leader is a really important thing. And so when you show that you know you have those stories too, and you share it with them, I think it gives some people some courage. So that's what I would do. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, so my name is Amit. So we talk about uh, breaking the marble ceiling. I'm trying my own midway uh, breaking that marble ceiling at home. Me and my wife have a very really healthy competition when it comes to uh, how much we make per year. So we are competing against each other, um, and I uh, honestly feel very good with them. But I have one question which I have: How many wives do you have? <laughs> Five ancestors, so I compete with them. Um, so just one question is that uh, women try to support themselves, and there are men, uh, I suppose, like me, who want to support that uh, feminism or equality more so. What do you think would be the role of men to make sure that the gender equality in terms of corporate sector or professionalism increases where women get their deal? And how can men push uh, women to do much better? Your question was what do com what should companies do to bring in equalities? <laughs> For men. No, 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 no,
But when we speak up, knowing that it's difficult, I think it's important for men to listen when you do that. Um, I also remember uh, we were talking about diversity and why diversity is a challenge. We we're talking about gender diversity in specific. And I made a comment, and right away, all of the other leaders who were men said, oh, do you mean we should give women special treatment? It took a lot of courage for me to say what I did, and right away I was shut down. Thankfully, my manager said, you know what, we may not agree with her, but let's hear her out. I think that's the support we need. Um, I think we just, it doesn't mean listen to us. I'm sorry, it doesn't mean do what we're saying, but at least allow that voice to come in. And I think whether it's men or women, like you said, and you had said that earlier as well, Sue, to amplify that, I think is important. And that's important in you know um, corporate environments, especially where I think we have more men than women, especially as you go to the top. I'd, I'd like to add on that that, uh, and this is this is actually advice for women too. Uh, we've all grown up in the different cultures, but we all seem to have this this global gender separation, and and we have unconscious biases that we're not aware of. Uh, once you, you put a cover over, you see two resumes, and you see the names, you automatically start to think different things about these two people. So I would I would urge everybody to question yourselves first. Question your assumptions. When you're, if you're a boss and you think, oh, this, this, this male on my team, he's the one that should be promoted. Maybe, you should, maybe it's merit, but maybe not. And, and we all have these biases. I have them. We all, I think we all do. And, and it's, it's, it's going to be a constant effort for at least a generation or more for us to, to break these, these models. Uh, so start to question yourselves and even even question others too. Why why is it? Why is why is he being promoted and she's not? Uh, why is the rule like this? Because all of this legacy stuff is just sitting around for generations now, and it's going to be up to us to remove it. And the first step is to to say why is this here? What is this doing here? All right, I'm sorry. We need to wrap up. Thank you so much. <laughs>